starting again. Welcome everyone. And as William said, I'm going to talk about execution plans. Now, people who know me will probably know that I can go rather deep on execution plans. That's not the intent today. This is a beginner level session where I'm going to talk about, as the title says, where do you even start with execution plans? Or as the subtitle says, I'm going to give a basic introduction. Nothing more than that. I only have 90 minutes. So I am Hugo Cornelis and I make SQLserverfast.com. SQLserverfast.com is the website where I built the documentation that Microsoft should have built. Correct, good, detailed de uh, documentation about execution plans. If you are the intended audience for this session, then you are not the intended audience for the execution plan reference yet. As a reference, it goes deep, it goes into details. So it's not for a, a learning uh, opportunity, it's really to check your facts, to get more information, etc. And as I already mentioned when I chatted with William, I'm also uh, starting to release uh, training videos where I talk in uh, great detail through everything related to execution plans. And uh, because everyone is sitting at home right now with the lockdowns, uh, they're starting to release it here in the Netherlands now, but it will probably take some time before everyone is really out on the streets again. Because we all have more time and uh, less things to do, I've decided that at least for now, the training videos that are already finished are completely free. On SQLserverfast.com, I also have other content. And uh, apart from that, I do a lot of other stuff. But you really don't care about that. What you care about is how can you reach me? So if you have questions after today, if you have questions during the uh, session, put them in the chat or in the Q&A window and William will read them to me. If you have questions later, send me an email or hit me on Twitter and I will try to respond. I understood when listening to Guy's uh, uh, presentation that the deck and the demo code will be available through the group buy code. If you can't wait, just go to sqlserverfast.com, click other presentations and then presentation resources, and you can already download the uh, presentation deck and all the demo code I use right now. I uploaded it earlier this morning. So where do we start talking about execution plans? The agenda is to first talk about why do we even care? Why do we bother with execution plans? Who cares about them? Well, I do obviously, but why should you? I hope to convince you to stay around after that and uh, because you do care and then you will want to know where to find them how to read them and I'm going to talk about properties and at the end I want to run you through through some examples to show how you can start to read quite simple execution plans and the things you can already glean from reading those execution plans but let's start with why do we even care about execution plans why are they relevant and to understand the relevance of execution plans, you need to understand the difference between SQL Server or rather SQL, the programming language, and traditional third generation programming languages. So in those traditional third generation programming languages, what happens is that the developer tells the computer step by step exactly what to do. In those cases, obviously, because you are dealing with large collections, there will be loops and they can be coded in different ways. And how this method exactly works is in what order things are done, how the logical uh, steps are taken, in which order the steps are taken, that is all chosen by the developer. So the developer will tell the computer exactly do this, then do that, then do that third thing. And then if something is true, do yet another thing and else start over from the uh, from step one. That's traditional third generation uh, programming and a lot of people have experience with that, have learned this in uh, their school careers, have done it in their jobs. And if you work like this, if your code is slow, the blame is always on the developer. You wrote the code, you wrote it in a bad way, so it's your problem and you can fix it. 
all this traditional knowledge goes overboard once you start working with relational databases. Because relational databases use SQL, Structured Query Language, which is a language that works different. In SQL, you don't tell the computer step by step what to do. You tell the computer what you want it to do. You tell the computer what your desired end result is. And then the computer itself figures out how to do it. So I tell the computer, this is the collection of data I want. The reason that this type of programming is also sometimes called set-based language is because the description is based on the set. I describe a result I want. And in that logical description, I pretend it's all happening at once. In reality, a computer cannot do that. In reality, a computer still has to loop through instructions. And that's where something called the query optimizer comes in. The query optimizer looks at my query, looks at all it knows about my tables, my indexes, my views, and everything else I have available. And then it will try to figure out the best way to give me the data I want as I specified it in my query. So it's here, it is the query optimizer that determines what algorithms are used. And that's where it gets interesting because most of the time the query optimizer is smart enough and is good enough and gives me a good enough performance. But sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes the query optimizer, for whatever reason, doesn't come up with the best possible execution plan. It doesn't come up with the best possible way, the best possible algorithm. And now the code is slow. And who will get the blame? The developer or the DBA. And of course, I as the developer or the DBA can say, hey, it's not my fault, it's the query optimizer. But my boss will say, I don't care. I hired you to fix it. So here is the problem. I didn't choose the algorithm. I didn't tell SQL Server in what order to process the tables, how to process them. I just told SQL Server what results I want. SQL Server chose a suboptimal algorithm and I need to fix it, but I don't even know what algorithm SQL Server chose. And before I go deeper into that, I want to do a quick sidestep to, because the previous slide, this slide is all about SQL as a language, which is supported by almost every relational database management system. What I put on this slide is true for every database. In SQL Server, we work with Transact SQL, T-SQL, which is a dialect of that language. And in T-SQL, we can mix the true SQL queries, where we describe the result we want, with more procedural code, so more the traditional code. So this means, because there's multiple ways to program, that there's multiple problems that can occur. We can have procedural code, that, where I chose a bad algorithm, and if that is bad, I can choose a different algorithm, or better yet, don't use procedural code. Most of the time, procedural code is slower in SQL Server. SQL Server is optimized to use set-based code as much as possible. So this is not what I'm going to talk about today. This is something that you should just try to avoid. But what if a single query is slow? That is where the previous slide applies. I wrote a query. I told SQL Server, this is the results I want. SQL Server gave me the results I want, but took too much time because the algorithm chosen was not optimal. But I don't know what algorithm was chosen. And that's where the execution plan comes in. Because when I look at the execution plan, now SQL Server tells me, this is the algorithm I chose. This is how I processed your query. And that is why we care. Because when my boss is yelling at me that the query is too slow, I can now look at the execution plan. And the first step of fixing the problem is understanding the problem. So I can look at the execution plan and the execution plan will tell me, here's how I, SQL Server, thought was the best way to, fix, uh, to run your query. And I can look at it, I can understand why it was slow, and then I can try to fix that. So hopefully by now you all know why execution plans are relevant. And I think this is a good place uh, for questions if there are any, William. So far we've had a very quiet chat and questions area. That's because I'm rattling very fast. <laughs> Not good. at all, everything seems fine. Good. So hopefully 
I have convinced everyone that they should care as well. And that means that they now want to know where to find execution plans. So where do we find them? And that is not as straightforward a question as you may think, because it depends on why you want to find them and how you want to find them. So broadly, there are two categories. If you are a production DBA and your, career, your server is overloaded or jobs at night are maybe slow and they do hundreds of queries or resources are scarce and there are problems, you may need to look at the entire production workload to find the problem plans. And there's a lot of tools available for this. You can query the plan cache, you can use the query store, use extended events, or God forbid, trace if you're on a really old SQL Server version. Uh, you can use exter uh, third party monitoring tools, you can query the DMVs, and none of this is in scope for this session. Because this session is not about finding execution plans, it's not about doing your job as a production DBA, it's about how to get started with execution plans. Now, if you do want to know more about all these tools on the screen, I heavily recommend that sometime after uh, this conference is over, you go to the website of Redgate. Um, they have uh, uh, books, and one of the books is uh, Execution Plans, third edition, written by Grant Fritchie. I was the technical editor for that. So any errors in the books are all my responsibility. But all the goodness in there is from Grant, and he has some chapters devoted to all these tools to find problem plans on your production server. I'm not going to talk that about that today. I'm going to talk about you have one specific query, you know that there is a problem with it. Maybe the query runs too slow, maybe it takes too much resources. Either a user complained that their report was slow and you know the query that underpins the report, or maybe your production DBA came to you and said, you deployed this query, it's running 10,000 times uh, per day, it's taking so many resources that my server is now uh, under too much load, so you need to make it more efficient. You know the query, that's the starting point. So for this entire session, we're not going to find the problem query, we know the problem query, we're going to look at the execution plan to try to find out why it is a problem query. So how do you find your plan when you have the query? Let's jump into a demo. And now part of my screen is blocked by the face of William. So I need to switch William to the side. Okay. <coughs> so let's say that this query has been given to me as the problem query. Well, if my actual life was so easy that my problem query would literally call a function called delay, I would make my money a lot easier than I do now. Unfortunately, in reality, it's often more hidden than this. This is obviously a simple demo uh, where I'm just going to show how it works. In reality, it's always more complex than what you see in a demo. So let's first make sure that I'm in the correct uh, database. Now there are multiple ways to see the execution plans for a query. So I'm going to highlight this query, and I'm going to hit this button. I'm going to zoom in a bit first. It's called Display Estimated Execution Plan. If I click that button, you will immediately see an execution plan appear. Don't worry if you can't read it yet, we'll come to that later. But this is what was traditionally called the estimated execution plan. I don't like that term. I prefer to call it the execution plan or the execution plan only because that's what it is. If you look at this version of the execution plan, you only look at the execution plan. You tell SQL Server, please tell me how you would run this query if I were to execute it, but you're not going to execute it. So no matter how long this query would have run, asking the execution plan is very fast. Another option is to use this button, and I'm going to zoom in again, include actual execution plan, and again, forgive me, but I dis disagree with Microsoft's terminology. This is not an actual execution plan, but it's the same execution plan, but there's some extra data in there. This is, and as you see, nothing happens when I click it. It just changes color because it's a toggle. It's a toggle, and when I enable it, I tell SQL Server, when you execute the query, then 
don't only return the results, but also when you're done running the query, show me the execution plan that you used and add some extra details to that that you added during the execution. And as you already see, there is some more data visible here. There's a lot more extra data in harder to access places that we'll get to later. But this is the execution plan plus runtime statistics. Now, the problem with the execution plan plus runtime statistics, you already noticed that it took a few seconds before it even appeared because it is only shown when the query is done executing. Sometimes you don't want to wait for that. And that's where the third button comes in. I need to highlight it first. It's called include all live query statistics. And that's also a toggle. So I'm going to enable that and I'm going to disable the execution plan plus runtime statistics and I'm going to run the query one more time. And now you will see that the execution plan appears immediately and then the query starts running. And while the query is running, snapshots of the data are constantly being updated on my screen until it's ready. So those are three different ways. And you may have noticed if you look careful enough that the execution plan, the names of the icons and the icons that were shown were the same every time. It's just the numbers that were a bit different. So it was the same execution plan, but with different data added as runtime statistics or as live statistics. So let's jump out of the demo and back into the presentation. So those are the three ways that you can get an execution plan for a specific query. The execution plan only, which used to be called the estimated execution plan. And the reason I don't like that name is too many people think when looking at the name because the name suggests this. And I've actually seen it written on websites. If you ask for the estimated execution plan, you will get a the SQL Server will do a quick scan of your query and then present you an execution plan that it thinks it will use, but it might choose a different execution plan when you actually execute it. Well, if it worked like that, it wouldn't be very useful, frankly. And luckily it doesn't. If you hit the estimated execution plan button, you get the execution plan, period. That is the plan that SQL Server will use when you submit the query basically hitting the estimated execution plan button is you say SQL Server, here's a query, execute it. And SQL Server starts the first step by compiling the plan. And then you interrupt it and say, ha ha, fooled you. I didn't want to execute it. I just wanted to know how you would execute it. That's what happens. So the plan shown is how the query will be executed. And yes, there are some exceptions, but they are caused by recompiles. Sometimes a plan has to be compiled again. The query has to be compiled again, and then you get a new plan. But it's the same process. So the execution plan only is, this is how I am going to execute the query if you submit it right now. The second was the execution plan plus runtime statistics, which used to be called the actual execution plan. Again, very confusing because all execution plans are actual, none are fake. Same process is used. SQL Server first compiles the plan and then it actually gets to execute the query because we don't interrupt him. And during this execution, it has some counters internal that will then be added to the plan as extra data. So you get the same plan as you would get with the execution plan only, except that now those runtime statistics are also there. And they can be useful. They can really help you to identify why your query was slow. But obviously the downside is you need to wait until the query has finished executing. And if the query runs in eight seconds as my demo query, that's acceptable. If your query takes two hours to run, yeah, you don't really want to complete, wait for that two hour query after every change you make, especially if you need to make it a lot of changes and do a lot of trial and error. So you can't always afford to use the execution plan plus runtime statistics. The last option I showed was the execution plan with live statistics, also known, known as a live execution plan, where the same process happens as with the execution plan plus runtime statistics, except that you get snapshots of those runtime statistics sent to your screen while the query is executing. One downside is that you get less statistics than with the execution plan plus runtime statistics. So the execution plan plus runtime statistics includes all the runtime statistics, the live execution plan includes only a subset of the runtime statistics. 
So here's a table, and I'm not going to talk you through the entire table. You can download the deck later and look at all the details. But here in this table, I tried to highlight all the differences between the three versions of execution plans that you can request. And this is again a good time for some questions if there are any, William. Nope, there's been um, a link in the comments to uh, the book that you mentioned from Grant Fritchie. Otherwise, ah, cool. currently uh, no active questions. I think I also have a link to it on one of my last slides, but great that someone was uh, proactive and uh, put that link in the chat, thank you. So we found the execution plans. And like I said, don't worry about what you see here yet. We'll come to that. That's where we're going now. How are we going to read those execution plans? So here you see a simple example of an execution plan. I don't think it's this, uh, I'm not even sure anymore if it's the same I used in the demo, doesn't matter. This is a very typical, extremely simple execution plan. Real execution plans are of course never this simple, but we need to start somewhere. And if you look at this, you will see a pretty picture. And if you have never seen an execution plan before, that's all you see and you have no clue what you're looking at. So let's yeah, let's assume this is the first time you see an execution plan. To start understanding this, you need to know that there's only two different elements inside each execution plan. One are the small icons. All icons represent something called operators and every operator can be best thought of as a small computer program that does one specific task. And we'll get to that in a bit more detail later. But first let's look at the other element. Those are the arrows. And the arrows are the data flows. They're not actually elements of the plan. They just represent how data flows from one worker to another. So some, sometimes I compare an execution plan to an assembly line in an old fashioned factory where every worker has their own task and then passes their intermediate pro uh, product to another worker who then does the next step and the final result will be hopefully a nice car or machine or whatever they are producing there. So let's look into a bit more detail at the operators, the icons. Like I said, every operator is a small program that does one specific task, just like the specialized workers in the assembly line. And if you look at more in more detail at the operators, if you look at the programming le level where normally only Microsoft would look, then you know that every operator has exactly three functions. They can be called in three ways or entry points is there, also called in .NET uh, or methods. I don't know what the terminology is. Anyway, an operator can be called with an initialize call. And as the name suggests, <coughs> apologies. As the name suggests, the initialize call is used when you want the uh, operator to prepare to do work. However, the initialize call can also be used to reinitialize, restart the operator from the top. And when you reinitialize an operator, sometimes parameters used in the operator can be changed, affecting how it works the second time it works. <clears throat> the most important function, the one you are usually concerned with, is the get next. Every time the get next is called of an operator, tell the operator, give me a row. That means that the operator does whatever it is programmed to do, its own specific task, until it can give you a row, then it will hand you that row. And the U here is of course the parent operator that does the call. Now, because most operators do not just uh, concoct rows out of thin air, most operators, when they need to produce a row, need to get data from yet other operators. So that's how you get a whole network of operators calling other operators to get rows. We'll see that in detail later. The final call is close, which is actually very, I'm not going to say irrelevant because it's important to clear up memory that was used, 
but it's not interesting for understanding execution plans. I have never ever had to do anything with the close call. But I'm glad that Microsoft built it and called it because otherwise we will be leaking memory left and right, of course. So we will mostly be looking at the get next and sometimes you need to get look at the initialize. The close is just there. The term operator itself is an overloader term and it can be confusing if you don't understand the two different meanings that are both used with the same word. So one meaning is the term operator can be used as a generic type of operator. The description here is a copy paste from my website, so it's not necessarily easy. It's mostly correct and complete. But the, fil the simple way to rephrase this would be the filter operator runs a test on the rows it receives and only passes those for which the test is true. This is a description that applies to the class of operators known as filter. Not every operator does the same test. Not every filter operator does the same test that is determined somewhere else. There can be multiple in an execution plan. And that's where the second example comes in. So a coworker might tap me on the shoulder, ask me to look at his screen and say, hey, I have a plan here. And there's a filter operator here, and there's a filter operator there, and then there's one there. And I understand this one and this one, but the one here is the one I have a problem with. Now he isn't talking about the filter operator as a class, but about three occurrences of that class. And in both cases, the word operator is used. That's confusing but it's life, it's reality. We have to deal with it. I'm going to fix it almost always from the context. It's clear whether someone is talking about a class of operator or about a specific occurrence. Oh, um, Hugo. Yes. There's one question come through. Um, does the estimated execution plan stay in the plan cache? I am going to respond to that by saying there is no thing as an estimated execution plan. That's just a mislabeled button in Management Studio. Uh, an execution plan is stored in the plan cache after the query executes once by default or after the query executes twice if the setting optimized for ad hoc workloads has been enabled. Once an execution plan is in the cache, it stays there with some reasons why it can go again. If you ask for an execution plan only, the button estimated execution plan, SQL Server will do the normal steps to get the execution plan. And the first step is check if there's one in the cache. So if you ask for an estimated execution plan, it will not be stored in the cache. But if it's already in the cache, you will see the version that is in the cache. Fantastic, thank you. So <coughs> that was what I had to say about the operators. Now about the arrows. And I said before, arrows do not even actually exist. They are just representation. So in the execution plan, operators can call other operators. Why do they call them? To get rows. When an operator calls another operator, it will typically be a get next call. Give me a row so that I can do my job. In the execution plan, it is laid out exactly by the optimizer which operator can call which other operator. And that is what the arrows represent. If you look at the actual execution plan, it's an XML document. Then the whole arrow is nowhere to be seen, but you can be inferred by looking at the positioning of the elements within the XML. So it's important to understand in every execution plan, an operator can only be called by exactly one other operator. Every operator in the execution plan will always have exactly one operator calling it. The only exception is the top left operator, which isn't really an actual operator, but a representation of the client. So because this has to do with uh, um, Graph theory was the term I'm looking for. There are some terminologies from graph uh, theory that are used here. So the terms parent and child are very common in graph theory. And this is also used here, a parent operator and a child operator. So when operator A calls operator B, 
then operator B is called the child of operator A and operator A is called the parent of operator B. And operator B being the child always has exactly one parent. Operator A being the parent might have more than one child. That's what I have in this uh, uh, bullet point. Every operator can call zero, one or more child operators. So there are operators that have no children, that are operators that have one child, and there are operators with multiple children. And if you then look at that in the graphical version, you will see what in mathematics, in graph theory is called a tree. And because of this, operators within a plan are often called nodes. Now this, this term node is, shouldn't be relevant, except that sometimes people use it. And when people use it, when people talk about a node in an execution plan, I want everyone who is listening right now to understand that what they mean is an occurrence of an operator within an execution plan. Which also means that if you are worried that someone might not understand whether you're talking about an occurrence of, a, of an operator or a class of operators, when you call, talk about a node, it's always an occurrence of an operator. So, any questions, uh, William? No, everybody is just hanging off every single word that you're uttering. So, Good. please continue. Yeah, I already hit a button ac accidentally when I moved in my chair. I just shouldn't move. So, I'm going to talk about some common misunderstandings because there are a lot of misunderstandings. And if you believe everything you find on the internet, and we all do that, right? If you believe everything you will find on the internet, you will fall for each and every one of these common understandings because they are oh so popular. Let's start with one and I'm just going to demo that. The cost per I think William already knows where I'm going with this. I can guess, yeah. <laughs> so, and again, this is just like the dbo.delay I showed in the previous one. This is not typical for real performance tuning. This is a silly example I constructed where I abused a, uh, a feature that is not even intended for this. That's why I abused it and not used it. But it works to give me a simple demo. So I have been given a query and this query was slow. And my manager says, Hugo, you need to make it fast. And this is my attempt to make it faster. Let's not go into the details of what I changed and why I changed it. But just going to make sure I'm in the correct database. And now what I sometimes see people do is select both queries in a single, uh, make, highlight them both, and then ask for the execution plan only. And if I ask for the execution plan only, and I'll just move the slider up a bit, you will see that there are two actual ex uh, real execution plans. There are actually three, but the, the third one is for an assignment and that isn't really exciting. So the query two and query three correspond to the original query and my tuning attempt. And now look, this is the original query and this is my tuning attempt. 99% and 1% and the label is query cost relative to the batch. So the entire batch costs 100% with the original query and the tuned version. The tuned version is 1% of the total cost and the original was 99%. I'm awesome, right? I'm a tuning god. I did great. Yes, you did, fantastic. Until someone points out, yeah, but it's an estimated execution plan. And that someone wasn't paying attention when I told them that execution plan, that estimated execution plans are execution plans. But okay, I'll run with it. You tell me this is an estimated execution plan. I should, should look at the actual execution plan instead. Okay, I'll enable the execution plan. Luckily, this query doesn't run for hours. So I'll just execute them both. Again, in a single batch, I get my results. Now this is, this is reality, right? This is actual. Can we now all agree that I'm actually a true god of query tuning? William doesn't dare to answer anymore. I, I, I don't blame I was him. muted. Yes, I completely <laughs> agree. You are a tuning god. The I am, but not, not for lie. this reason. <laughs> I am, but not for this reason. So 
let's do something else. I have disabled execution plan again. Now I'm going to look at the actual amount of IO and the actual amount of time taken in each of the two queries. So I'm going to enable the statistics IO and statistics time options. And I'm going to execute the two queries one more time. It helps to select the high, entire batch. I get the same results. And now I can see here how they actually ran. The first one ran in 40 milliseconds, used 689 logical reads. That was the slow version that I needed to optimize. And after this tuning God did his work, it's now three times slower, four times, I don't know exactly, I don't, don't, don't do math very well, and it uses 150 times as much logical reads. Oh, perhaps I'm the query tuning devil. So what went wrong here? Let's enable the execution plan again, and then I'll show you what went wrong. If I look at these execution plans and I hover my mouse over the select operator, I see something called the estimated subtree cost. And I'm going to highlight again the estimated subtree cost. This uh, property is present in every execution plan. It's part of how the execution plan is made. SQL Server does cost estimation to try to come up with the cheapest execution plan. Now, sometimes those estimates are wrong. That's often the case when your performance is bad because bad estimates can cause bad performance. But even in this execution plan, which is an execution plan plus runtime statistics, you do not get an actual cost. That's simply not a property that exists. Microsoft cares about the cost for choosing an execution plan. Once the execution plan is there, Microsoft doesn't care about the cost anymore. So there is no actual cost. So even in an execution plan plus runtime statistics, you only have the estimated subtree cost of 0 0.58 for the first query and of 0 0.006 for the second query. So based on those estimates, you understand where the 99% and the 1% come from. Based on those estimates, they're correct but the estimates were not correct in this case. In this case, they used a very brute and crude way to force SQL Server to have terrible estimates. And that's why this number 99% here, the 1% here are nonsense numbers. They are based on an estimate, but I'm looking at the query because the query performed terrible, which might be because the estimates are terrible. So I shouldn't put any faith in those numbers especially not when I haven't even verified the estimates yet. And here's another thing that you should be aware of because now I looked at two queries within a batch to determine which one was better and I showed that I proved nothing. But the pro another problem I see even more commonly is when people look at the execution plan like the one above, they will say, hey, cost 93%, this is relative to the query. So this is probably the operator that is causing my query to be slow. <clears throat> and again, this number, this 93% is based on the estimated subtree cost or rather the estimated co operator cost. What is my mouse doing? My, well, my mouse is uh, running wild. So I'm not okay, I'm going to highlight it. The estimated operator cost. There is no actual operator cost. So if you believe the websites that tell you, look at the operator with the highest cost and start optimizing there, you will sometimes be right, but definitely not, not, definitely not always. Questions on this, William? So far, we have a one which says, are those query cost percentages always not accurate? Should we never use them? I'll come to that later on one of the later slides. You'll come for that later. Okay. okay. Yes. So about the cost percentage, yes, yes, they look deceptively easy, but in reality, you're easy deceived by them. So they are always based on the estimated cost, as I just showed. Even in an execution plan plus runtime statistics, the so-called actual execution plans, there is no actual cost. 
So the percentages management studio shows are the estimated cost. If your estimated row counts are wrong, then those percentages will be wrong, period. If your estimated row counts are correct, then they can still be misleading. The entire architecture to determine how cost is computed was built in the times of SQL Server 6.5. I think that was when this was last completely re-architected. Correct me if I'm wrong and you still remember that, William. Then you show that you're even older than I am. <laughs> Which you. you are not, so I can safely challenge you on that. Um, anyway, the, this costing, the cost is just a number. It doesn't re reflect reality anymore. But it used to reflect reality. When this was built, there was one computer somewhere in a lab at Microsoft that was used to check the costing. So if you as a developer did something to, for instance, the sort operator, and then you had to adjust the costing, and what they did to verify that was they ran a query, they looked at the cost of your sort operator, the estimated cost, and it said 1.5, and the estimated row count was correct, then it had to finish in 1.5 seconds. So it used to correspond to the time. And that was on a really high-end machine. I think it had a whopping eight gigabytes of memory, that two whole cores. And it didn't have the standard 6400 RPM uh, disk, no, it had 7200 RPM disks. You see where I'm going with this, right? The architecture this was all based on was state of the art in the 90s of the last century. It's not the hardware you have now. And I have actually seen situations where this really bites you. I have seen situations where it is clear from the costing that SQL Server says, reading this again from this will be really expensive. But in reality, there is so much buffer pool that reading it again will not be from disk. It will be from the buffer pool. And even if it's read from disk, it will be from SSD and not from spinning disk. So I have seen situations where costing can actually result in bad execution plans, even though the cost, the estimates are correct, simply because SQL Server prioritizes the wrong things. And that's something that is not possible for us to fix. There's no way to tell SQL Server, hey, please stop pretending that all IOs will be physical and that they will be a spinning disk. We don't have those knobs. So those are the hardest cases to tune because you basically have to fool SQL Server into giving you what you want instead of what appears to be optimal based on how it is taught to think. And that's way beyond the level that I was planning to go, but there was a question on, on this. So I assume I have answered that question now. Let's move on to the second misunderstanding, the redirection. Mm -hmm. Before you do this that. This is the part where I really regret not being able to see the room with the attendees and go the, the hands go up. Because here you normally when, yeah? One second. Um, there is a question come in. Is it better to execute the original query and the optimized in uh, apostrophes query on different batches and sessions? If you want to show the difference in the estimated cost as a percentage, as I just did, you need to run them in a single batch because then you get the cost percentage as part of a batch. If you, um, uh, I, I normally do not run both in a single batch unless I really want to compare the execution plans under each other. But what I typically do is I have two windows open, one with the original query and the execution plan and another window where I'm working and after doing some work and doing something that I hope uh, improves the execution plan, I will look at the execution plan and check whether it does what I hoped it does. Okay. And uh, one further one just came in. Um, and I guess this goes to the very <laughs> basis of this entire topic. If we can't rely on plans, what can we do? I'm trying to understand where I gave the impression that you can't rely on plans because you can. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, uh, except that in many cases, if you just take the, should we say the vanilla plan, as you have quite clearly shown, 
if we take uh, a plan and it tells us uh, we're one percent or ninety nine percent, that's complete lies. Um, so if we can't really rely on those plans as they are shown, you, you can we have still to interpret rely, them a little bit more, right? You can still rely on the execution plan because it still shows how the query will be executed, and you can rely on those percentages if you know what they represent. Uh, estimated cost, not the mm -hmm. real cost. Mm -hmm. No matter which version of the plan you're looking, it's always an estimated cost, which may be wrong. That doesn't yeah. mean it's completely useless, but even in cases where it is completely useless, there's still a lot of other stuff in the execution plan that you can use. Yeah, completely agree, yeah. Of course, the next big question, and like I said, this is the one I always like to do live and with a show of hands, but unfortunately that's not possible here. But I do challenge all the viewers to think about this for a while. We have an execution plan. How do you read this? Do you read this left to right? Do you read this right to left? Or do you read this in yet another way? And if so, how? Most people, when I ask this in a room, will always raise their hand at right to left. Most resources you find on the internet will tell you, execution plans should be read right to left. That's why all people raise their hand, because they read the internet and they believe it. But you shouldn't do. You should never believe the internet. You should always check stuff for yourself. So before replying, Let's just dive into the details, or, or, or rather before telling you what my answer is to, the, to how to read the execution plan, let's dive into how this execution plan actually executes. So when execution starts, and I've told you before, the top left operator isn't a real operator. The top left operator represents the client. So the client asks SQL Server, give me a row, which translates into a get next call to the filter operator. At this point, the filter operator will go, I'd love to give you a row, but I have no row. So TableScan, please give me a row. And TableScan goes to the storage system, goes into the table and says, here, I have got a nice row for you, Mr. Filter. And now filter goes, ah, good, I have a row. I can do my job. My job is to filter. So I'm going to test some expression and see whether it's true or not. Oh. Dread. I don't like this row. I don't want this row. Uh, table scan, give me another row. Sure, here's another row. Ah, I can filter again. Let's test the expression. Ah, yes, this row is nice. Mr. Select, or rather Mr. Client, here is your row. And then obviously the select operator will start, or the client will start asking for the next row and the whole process will repeat. Now I deliberately used multiple colors here because that illustrates what's going on. The red arrows show the flow of control. Operators call each other in the traditional reading direction of Western world, left to right. Because rows are returned as a response, the data flows from right to left. Now, why does everyone on the internet, well, everyone between brackets, of course, everyone on the internet say you should always read execution plans right to left because if you look at complex execution plans, at least nine out of 10 times, the easiest and fastest way to understand what's going on is to follow the data. So most of the time you are correct if you start at the right and just follow the flow of the data to see how the data flows through operators and is changed. But not always. There are exceptions. There are cases where an operator has a condition and that condition says, if this condition is true, don't even call your child operator at all. Now imagine a huge Christmas tree with hundreds of operators and you start at the right and you go through everything that's going on in the execution plan. And then halfway through, you come at an operator that has a condition and you look at the condition and he says, oh, I just wasted two hours because this entire branch that I just analyzed was never called at all. That's not cool. That's not how you want to spend your time. So right to left is sometimes right, sometimes not. Left to right is sometimes right, sometimes not. So my reply is the redirection is something else. You read it in whatever direction is needed. 
Sometimes I start at the right, sometimes I start at the left, sometimes I start somewhere in the middle. And that's also experience speaking. So that's something I cannot give you like, oh, this is how you do it. The more execution plans you've seen, the more execution plans you have analyzed, the more you start to recognize cases where something is off in the execution plan. And you look at the execution plan and you see areas and you're like, that is a suspect area, I'll start there. And I still pick the wrong areas to start sometimes. And I will always continue to do so because it's complex. But more experience means that you are getting a better feeling for which area of the execution plan is where you should start. And then you should understand data flows right to left, control flows left to right. You need to read them in all directions. Questions on how to read them and on common misunderstandings? Yeah, um, so there's one question open, maybe not directly in that area, but still, if the cost percentage in the execution plan is incorrect at times, does that reflect that the stats may be out of date? That is definitely a very common uh, cause for bad estimates. It's not a guarantee. There can be other reasons why the cost estimates are wrong. But if I see an execution plan uh, where I notice that the cost estimates are wrong, most of the time it's because the row count estimates are wrong, and that is most of the time because stats are wrong. Not always. So if I see that, the first thing I do is try, depending on the size of the table and how busy the system is, to update the stats, check if it helps. If it doesn't, that's where it really gets interesting. Is that correct? Is it sufficient answer? I think so. I think so, yeah. Good. No more questions? Just now, no. There's been a few ex or oh, like um, uh, opinions into reading right to left or left to right. Uh, but I think you've completely covered that there is no right way to read them. You've got to read it back and forth, forth and back. And yes. um, also understand that SQL Server will lie to you. <laughs> oh, yes. It, it gives uh, SQL Server the opportunity to lie and it will through its teeth. Especially when use different functions are involved. But that's, that's a different session. Anyway. Let's go on about properties. So far I've looked most of the time just at the pretty picture of the execution plan. And that's like looking at the iceberg from a ship. You see the tip of the iceberg, the graphical execution plan, but most of reality is hidden beneath the surface in the properties layer. And if you don't look at properties of the execution plans, you might just as well not look at the execution plans at all because you're missing what is relevant. You should always look at the properties. So let's look at how to understand why properties are so important. I have two queries here. They're quite different. And yes, I know I used the star in code. I shouldn't, but this is a demo. I can do bad stuff here. And as you see, here is a star, so it's all the columns and there's no where clause, so it's all the rows. And here there is a where clause and there is a column list. So there's two quite different queries. I'm going to execute them and you'll see the first query, lots of columns. And in the corner here, 20,000 rows returned. The second query, far less columns, and also far less rows. Uh, well, uh, let's just use this method again. 14,000 in this time the case. So the queries work as expected. Cool. Now the queries have of course been executed by running the execution plan. If I look at the execution plans, I see no difference. Well, in the execution plan with runtime statistics, you do see some difference because the runtime statistics are different. But if I look at the execution plan only, you will actually see two identical execution plans if you just look at the surface. Execution engine does not have access to the query. The execution engine uses only the execution plan. 
these execution plans appear identical and yet they return different results. The reason for that is different properties. If I hover my mouse over the clustered index scan here and I will zoom in again, you will see after hovering for a while, a window pop up with a subset of the properties of this operator. And the one I want to call out here is the predicate. Here is where a test is done on modified date, which corresponds to the where clause in the query. So here is why not all rows were returned. Here also is an output list that shows that only these five columns should be returned. So this is where the extra details were hidden that make this query different from the other query. Because if I do the same hovering trick here, you will see that there is no predicate property. All rows are returned. And you will also see a longer list of column names, which is even shortened. The ellipsis here shows this is all I have room for. If you want to know more details, you can right click go to properties and in my case that will only highlight this window because i leave it open all the time and in this window you can see even more properties and if i click here and i will just pop it out for a while so that you can see it better i normally just leave it in the uh, side uh, line but here you can see the complete list of all the columns that were returned so all the data that the uh, SQL Server needs to ensure that the two queries return the correct different result sets are stored in the execution plan, but not visible if you just look at them from the outside. You need to zoom in and look at the properties. So, so uh, uh, before, before you continue, there's a question yes. here. Mm -hmm. Do execution plans stay the same from version to version if the same compatibility level is used? That's an excellent question. Uh, the answer is no, that's not guaranteed. Uh, compatibility level is mostly concerned with ensuring that stuff still works the same on a functional level. But... Uh, improve improvements in the optimizer are typically not hidden behind the uh, uh, compatibility level there are more there are nowadays in the later versions uh, uh, starting to appear exceptions to that uh, apologies uh, there are starting to appear uh, exceptions to that especially when you look at uh, innovations like adaptive query processing and intelligence query processing those are features that because their Microsoft considers them slightly experimental and um, they identify that there might be cases where they backfire, uh, you need to go to a new uh, compatibility level. But a lot of improvements in the optimizer are simply there when you upgrade. And even if that's not the case, you might still get a new execution plan because once you upgrade, all execution plans will be recompiled. This is slightly off topic, but SQL Server likes to store execution plans in the memory in the plan cache so that it doesn't have to work through the entire optimization every time you run your query. You can simply reuse the cached uh, uh, execution plan. When you upgrade, all execution plans will be compiled again based on new versions of the statistics, which can result in new execution plans. As I just showed in the demo, one way to get access to the uh, properties is to hover your mouse over an icon. That shows you this yellow pop-up window with a subset of the properties for that operator. You cannot configure this. Microsoft decided which, oper which properties should be in this list and which should not. We cannot change that. And personally, I don't always believe that Microsoft made the best decisions there. A lot of them I do agree with, some I think are questionable. I didn't show this in the demo, but you could also hover your mouse over an arrow. If you do that, you get a smaller subset of properties for the operator on the right-hand side of that arrow. Remember, the arrow itself is not an element in the execution plan. It's a representation of how operators are positioned and how they call each other. 
So the arrow itself doesn't have properties. It's a subset of the properties for the operator on the right-hand side. And the subset is specifically related to the amount of data that the operator produces. The last version I showed, uh, this one I did show, is right-clicking the icon and selecting properties. If you leave the properties window open, you don't have to right-click anymore. I didn't do that in the demo and I'll just show it now. So if you keep your eyes on the properties window on the uh, uh, bottom right of my window, when I click, this, this, just left-clicking what I do, if I click various icons here, or even arrows, you will see that the data in the properties window changes. So instead of closing uh, the window every time and then right-click properties, I just leave it open at all times, pinned uh, to the side, because I use it all the time. If you never ever use execution plans, then A, why are you here? And B, then I understand that you want to close it. But if you are going to work with execution plans, just leave it open all the time. And this is the only place where you can find all properties. <coughs> now, I already mentioned a few times on the top left is an icon and I call it an operator, but it's not a real operator. It represents the client requesting rows. And yet there are properties on that fake operator. Those are not properties of an operator. Those are properties of the plan and they are extremely important. So let's jump right back into the demo. And I will show, for instance, on this select operator, I click it so that I have the list here. And I will, I'll just pop it out again and make it a bit larger. That's easier to read. So if you look here, you will see that there's a long list of properties and all of them give information about the plan as a whole. Some of them are completely irrelevant, some are a bit relevant, some are very relevant. Most of them have a name that is uh, interesting enough that you already understand what it is. Not all of them, so some may uh, need more data details. I'm not going to go through them and explain them because I don't have time for that, but it is really important that you do learn what these properties are and that you do learn to look at them and use them. So a quick question in between. Um, yes. Are there any, or is there any info more, inf sorry, important information you can only find in the execution plan XML that are not displayed in the operator properties panel? I'm not going to say important, but there are some cases, the weird edge cases where data in the XML is not displayed in Management Studio. It may have to do with new versions. If you're running a very new version of SQL Server beta version or uh, how the CTP is what they, what the cool kids call it nowadays, and SSMS isn't upgraded yet, it may be a new property that SSMS doesn't know yet. And there are some very weird edge cases, but I wouldn't call them important and they're definitely not in scope for this session. Let's just say that I do a lot of work with execution plans and I am forced to look in the XML maybe two or three times per year. Okay, That's, that makes it quite clear, I think. I hope so. <coughs> now, like I said, an explanation of all those properties is not in scope for decisions. Most of them are finally self-explanatory and I am documenting all of them on the execution plan reference website and especially the properties for the plan as a whole are already there for the top left operator. The properties for the other operators are not all there yet because I simply have to go through dozens of different operators and describe them all. So that uh, concludes the theoretical part. Now it's time to jump into a demo, look at an actual execution plan and try to work my way through it and try to show you how you can read an actual execution plan for an actual query, unless there are at this point any questions or unless I'm running out of time. Well, just so you know, we have done an hour and five minutes. I was so, afraid that. <laughs> <laughs> you still have around about 10 minutes to be able to uh, wrap up. 
to show Good. your example maybe uh, and we have here one question that just came in mm -hmm. um, can we successfully evaluate the quality of the execution plan without runtime data i know this is like a particular sticky point for you and there's been huge discussions around what those mean in terms of uh yeah runtime and execution statistics what belongs to a plan and what doesn't i'm trying to understand what the question exactly means so if uh, about if we get an execution plans and see if they are equal yeah well if we're looking at an execution plan without any runtime statistics to say mm -hmm. whether or not the estimations were correct no, whether it, the you know if, if there if is no runtime have, statistics at all, how can you evaluate if, an execution? If you don't have runtime data, I'll just show this here. If I look at execution plan only, and someone sends me this in an email, there's no way for me to say, uh, okay, uh, estimated number of rows is forty-four. Is that correct? How do I know? I don't have access to yep. your database. Yep. From the execution plan, that's impossible to say. If you know your database, if you work with this database every day, you might know that this is wrong mm -hmm. because you understand your query and you understand your database. But from so the execution shot... plan only, there is no way to say this. But as soon as I do an execution plan plus runtime statistics, then of course I do get the ability to compare this estimated number with the actual number. So the, the short answer to that would be uh, without runtime run statistics, you can't really make any determination. It's more yes. a, uh, you, you require a true answer to what was this execution actually going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. So I have a query here and I'm going to include the execution plan plus runtime statistics and run the query. I'm not even really interested in what the query does. I'm just going to look at the execution plan and talk you through what is going on here. And in this case, I am going to follow the data because as I said, in most cases, following the data works. So I start at the top, at the far right, at the index seek. And if I zoom in here, I will see that there is a seek predicates where I am looking for data with a product ID equal to 710. What this means is that, I'll just drag this down a bit and then scroll to the query. This corresponds with where product ID equals 710. Now an index seek is something, and I don't have time to talk about all the operators that are there, but if I quickly go to SQL Server fast.com. If you want to know more about the specific operator, you can always go here and index seek, click it, and then you will see that there is probably more information there than you ever want to know. But you can choose and pick how much you read. The basics is an index seek looks at the structure of your index and uses the structure of your index to quickly access the data it wants. And in this case, the data it wants is the data with uh, product ID equal to 710. So instead of reading everything in the sales order detail table, we only read the sales order details we're interested in. And if I look at this here, you will see that it expected to read 44, to return 44 rows, and in reality, it also returned 44 rows. Those 44 rows are returned to a nested loops operator. A nested loops operator is an operator that joins two sources and it uses the data it, return, it got from the index seek to feed a key lookup. And a key lookup also return, is like a seek, so it also has a seek predicates. I'm not going to go into details of what is here. But what I'm going to show is that this index seek returns on average one row per execution, and we expect that it will execute 44 times. Reality is it returned 44 rows total, which is exactly what was expected. On all the versions of Management Studio, these properties are labeled rather confusing. They are labeled actual number of rows and estimated number of rows, and those would be the 44 and the one. 
which you cannot really compare. So this is a recent improvement in Management Studio and I highly recommend that you upgrade to 18.5 to get this improvement because otherwise the data is, there is very confusing. So what here happens here is the index seek is used to quickly find all the data with the correct product ID. And then that data is used for each of the 44 rows that we want to find additional data in the sales order detail table. Knowing this already tells me there is an effective index. So I don't need to look at finding an effective index. There is one. But the index doesn't return all the data SQL Server wants. It needs to do a key lookup to get additional data. That's interesting to know because perhaps I can create a covering index and speed up this query. Now, creating a covering index comes at a cost. Other qu queries might uh, be, uh, uh, not benefit from it or might even go slower. So it's never a question of just looking at a single query and doing what's best for that query. But those are considerations you can have here. I also see because it's a nest loops, SQL Server expects not many rows because nest loops is optimal for low numbers of rows. There's another nest loops into a clustered index seek and that is because I'm joining sales order detail to sales order header in the query. This index seek and the key lookup are both for sales order detail. So here's a clustered index seek on sales order header to get matching data that is needed for the join. And then there's a sort. I don't like sorts in execution plans. Sorts tend to be expensive. They tend to also slow down everything because the sort has to wait until all data is there before it can start uh, producing data. But in this case, I need to order by something that is computed from the rest. So there is little else a SQL Server can do. And if this is a functional requirement, then there's nothing I can do about that sort. If I want to look at the details, I can always zoom into the sort and see, before, for instance, here in the properties, it's ordering by customer ID ascending. So this isn't even the sort that I expect for the order quantity. This is a different sort. And I'm wondering why is this sort there? Because if you look at the query, there's nothing in the query that says order by customer ID. It says group by customer ID. So why is this sort there? Because here is a stream aggregate. And if you look in the details of what a stream aggregate does, stream aggregate does aggregation. So instead of having the 44 rows in the input, the output now has only 28 rows because it was aggregated by customer ID. SQL Server has two operators that do aggregation. It can do a stream aggregate and it can do a hash match aggregate. Hash match doesn't require data to be sorted, but does require a lot of memory. Stream aggregate doesn't require a lot of memory, but does require sorted data. So the optimizer made a, a judgment call between two evils. Am I going to do a hash match with the memory requirement and with the, all the overhead? Or am I going to do the much cheaper stream aggregate, but then I need to sort with the memory overhead and the uh, uh, extra cost of the sorting. SQL Server does that by comparing the estimated costs of the two. So in this case, because the estimated row counts and the actual row counts continue to match everywhere. I didn't show it everywhere, but they match throughout this execution plan. I think that the call is probably correct, although I, based on the hardware I actually have versus the hardware SQL Server assumes it's still running on, it might not be the most effective yet. And I might want to investigate if this is really a problem query, if I get better performance by somehow trying to uh, strong arm the optimizer into giving me a hash match aggregate instead of a sort and a string aggregate. And then here is the actual sort on a computed column, EXPR1003. If you see EXPR in a SQL Server execution plan, it's always a column that's computed somewhere. In this case, it's computed in the stream aggregate uh, operator. Where you can look at the defined values and clicking this ellipsis button to explode it here. And you can see that EXPR1003 is computed as the sum of the order quantity. Well, that's not a surprise because that was literally what we asked for in the query. And we also asked to order by total quantity descending and then give us the top 10. 
So a top end sort does exactly that. It orders by EXPR 1003 descending, and then it returns the top 10, and I believe that 10 can be found here. So you can find everything that is in the query in the execution plan as well. Sometimes it takes a bit of searching. Sometimes you run into stuff where you're like, yeah, of course there's a sort there because I have an order by, and then you look at the properties and it's, oh, but it's sorting by something else. Why is it sorting by something else? And then you look at the neighboring pro operators and that's where you usually get the answer. I'm not going to talk you through the next execution plan because I'm running out of time. I'm just going to show it. This is the same query. The only thing I changed was instead of 710, I'm doing product ID 700, 711 here. And if I now look at the query in the execution plan, you see that the execution plan looks completely different. It's a totally different execution plan. A completely different choices are made. And that's all because for product ID 710, the estimates were that there were only be, would only be a few rows. And for 711, the estimates are that there will be a high number of rows. And in this case, the estimates are also correct. If you look here, you will see that the estimated and the actual number of rows are even spot on. Usually they are within five to 10%, that's okay. Within 20% is often okay as well. They're not wildly different. In this case, they're even spot on. So because SQL Server estimates that there will be far more rows, determines that I shouldn't do nested loops joins. I shouldn't do a key lookup. I shouldn't do this sort and then a stream aggregate. So now you see that it actually does choose a hash match aggregate just by changing one digit in a product ID, I got a completely different execution plan, which for this specific data is in fact more optimal. Uh, that was the wrong window. This was the one I wanted to go to. So those are two very simple examples and I talk you through one of them and I highlighted some differences in the second to help you understand how you can make sense of an execution plan and how stuff in the execution plan relates to stuff in the query but also how sometimes surprises in the execution plan can help you understand what happened behind the scenes and why the optimizer chose what it chose. This slide should have been removed because it was from an older version. I'm sorry for that. I didn't test this well enough. Like I said, a book written by Grant Fritchie about SQL Server execution plans. Uh, I was the tech editor for the third edition. I really think this is a great guide to read as a follow-up on this session because it starts at the getting started and it ends where you are at an intermediate and level of understanding. It's a completely free download. I have a tiny URL here because I hate a long uh, URLs. The long URL should be somewhere in the chat. Uh, if you want a dead free copy, those are not free, but you can order them from amazon.com. Um, my own website, the execution plan reference, very in-depth descriptions of each operator of all the properties. If you were the recommended audience for this session, then you don't need that yet. But I hope that you will continue to work with execution plans, continue to learn more, and one day you will be my recommended or my uh, target audience. Already my target audience is the execution plan video training, which is really uh, target. The basic level is a basic level. It is for beginners. So the stuff that's already there overlaps with what I've done today, but it's more than what I've done today. And like I said, for now it's free. So go to videos.sqlserverfast.com after group by is done and sponge every, all the knowledge uh, in your head that I can give you. If you want more courses, there's also a lot of good stuff on Pluralsight.com. Of course, once I have all my videos done, all of that on Pluralsight is completely obsolete. But don't take my word for it. Verify it and make your own decisions. That's all I have. I think we have a few more minutes left for questions, but I'm going to yeah. show my email, my Twitter, and uh, the place where you can already download everything. And I'm going to put the remote away. And William, 